Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our, Ralph Christie used to call the, the best conversation on campus regarding food, agriculture, environment, and various intersections thereof. And um, he, I wish he could be here today because he'd be thrilled with this talk that we're gonna have. Um, you know, for so long, we've talked about the importance of doing cross-disciplinary, cross-sectoral work, and we all wave our hands about how important it is. And Kyle Davis here is actually quantifying these intersections, which um, of course makes this kind of an approach much more policy relevant because policymakers like quantification. They like uh, definitive proof before they'll invest in approaches and strategies. So I'm personally really excited about hearing Kyle's talk. Um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Davis. He's an assistant professor of environmental data science. What a great term. I didn't know we had such a, is that a department? No, it's a self-created title. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> figures. <laughs> I love it. At the University of Delaware. And his work focuses on food systems, sustainability, and environmental change from local to national. And it looks like he has experience in India, Nigeria, China, and the U.S., perhaps among others. So from local to national to global scales. And his research employs data-driven mixed methods to quantify environmental, economic, and social dimensions of sustainability and to explore food system solutions for improving incomes, nutrition, natural resource, and climate adaptation, i.e. lots of different outcomes. So um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Davis here to talk to us and we're very glad to have you here. I wanna make one quick announcement first. Well, you can welcome them. And then I'm gonna do a first and a quick announcement while a few more people come in. That is um, anyone who would uh, enjoy having lunch and with uh, Dr. Davis after his talk is welcome to join, to come up to the front of the room here. And we will take you to a place where you can enjoy excellent refreshments and conversation afterwards. So welcome and thanks again for being here. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, really excited to be here and to talk to you about some of the research that my collaborators, my group and myself are doing, uh, attempting to measure different dimensions of sustainability as it relates to food production systems, but also using those measurements and quantifications to try and explore uh, solutions for making food systems and food production more sustainable. There we go. So as you're all probably very well aware, achieving more sustainable food systems represents a grand challenge in multiple ways. And among those many challenges, there's a need to obviously increase food supply in the future, improve rural livelihoods, enhance the nutritional quality of our food production, adapt to rising climate change, and minimize environmental impacts. And to meet all of those challenges, to attempt to meet all of those challenges simultaneously. Uh, so this figure on the right is just showing the current state of planetary boundaries across different dimensions, and the dotted areas uh, are these authors' best estimation of agriculture's contribution to uh, planetary boundary exceedance and. It's striking that across many of these planetary boundaries that agriculture is uh, really important and really influential. And uh, what, what I attempt to do with my research is to reframe agriculture as not uh, a grand problem, but as a solution to many problems. So uh, I think that this figure demonstrates that well. And so there's this need to think about food system sustainability across multiple dimensions, but the outcomes of food production and food systems manifest themselves across multiple scales as well. Uh, so I've just put a few examples here across different spatial scales. So at local scales, changes in productivity can affect uh, local farmer incomes. At regional scales, you can have 
changes in upstream water consumption that affect downstream availability. At international scales, changes in production stability within one nation can affect food security within countries that rely on imports from that country. Uh, and at the global scale, greenhouse gas emissions occurring uh, from individual farms ultimately influence global climate. And so there's this need to think about solutions that take into account these multiple dimensions and multiple scales. So for my talk today, I'm going to broadly categorize food system sustainability research. Oh, is that covering it? OK. I thought that was just my screen. Thanks. Um, so for my talk today, I'm going to broadly categorize two different scales of food system sustainability research and uh, argue that they're complementary to one another. So on one side, we've got global or international scale uh, research, and that's really useful for quantifying broad trends, for uh, highlighting hotspots where uh, change is needed, and for broadly testing solutions um, in a hypothetical sense. Um, those can feed into national, regional, local scale assessments that are really important for taking into account sociopolitical and cultural context and adapting specific solutions to specific locations. And so uh, these finer scale assessments can ultimately help to refine and inform global development efforts by making them more accurate and more effective uh, and hopefully taking into account uh, these nuances that occur from country to country and place to place. So I like to think of these uh, I like to think of these two different broad scales of research as forming these complementary virtu virtuous feedbacks uh, that can help to really enhance how we do sustainability research broadly and research specifically focused on food systems. So for my talk today, I'm going to give a couple of examples of work that my group's been doing at the global scale, uh, attempting to map irrigation and crop climate sensitivity globally. And then I'll also give uh, a couple of examples of work that we're doing at finer scales, where uh, I'll give an example of some crop switching work that we're doing and trying to quantify sustainability outcomes as a result of crop switching. And then I'll also talk about some work that we're doing to address agricultural data scarcity uh, and to help uh, serve as an information foundation for testing solutions in places where agricultural data currently doesn't exist or isn't uh, comprehensive. So for this first example, uh, we were really interested in kind of a basic research question. How have global irrigation patterns changed since the year 2000? And the reason that we asked this question is because a lot of global data sets related to agriculture and food security uh, are still based in the year 2000. So there's a real need to update this information and also Assessing changes in patterns through time can allow us to uh, better understand whether interventions related to water sustainability or other aspects of sustainability are moving in the right direction, where those interventions are maybe being effective or where there's additional action that's still needed. So my group uh, assembled this global irrigation database where uh, we sourced irrigation statistics from the FAO, from the United Nations, from a variety of reports from ministries of agriculture and irrigation associations. And so we were able to get, we were able to develop this database that covers uh, irrigation statistics, depending on the country from the federal all the way down to the municipal level. And we combined that with uh, geographic information on country boundaries, on uh, land and on land cover. Um, and then taking a couple of modeling and downscaling steps, we were able to develop these global gridded maps of irrigation uh, 
with decadal time steps up to the year from the year 1900 to 1990, and then with five year time steps for more recent years. And so I've dropped uh, some QR codes here in the presentation uh, related to different items that I'm going to be talking about. So feel free to scan away if you're interested more in a particular thing. Uh, this is a this QR code links to the the database uh, and maps for irrigation statistics, as well as the preprint for the, the study that um, one of my students led. But uh, so feel free to scan. I'll try and leave those up to give people an opportunity. Um, but this is a global picture of what irrigation, irrigation patterns look like currently. Um, so you can see some really characteristic places where we know that irrigation is heavily occurring. So uh, you can see like in the California Central Valley, in the US Midwest, in the lower Mississippi Basin here in the US, uh, those are places where there's intensive irrigation happening. But uh, other places that I'm sure you're aware of where there's heavy irrigation that occurs, Northern India and the Indus Basin, uh, Northeast China, you can see the Nile Delta here and the Nile River. Um, so, I think this map is really compelling because it shows how widespread irrigation is and it conveys how large uh, how large of an impact agriculture has on global water resource use. And so because we develop these different time steps, we're also able to look at where irrigation's been increasing, where it's been decreasing. Uh, and so this is a map comparing the year 2015 and 2020 and, or sorry, year 2000 and 2015. And you can see there's a lot of heterogeneity. Um, the places shown in red and purple are where there's been irrigation decreases over the, that 15 year period. And the places shown in blue are the places where there's been irrigation increases. Uh, you can see in the US, uh, the Western US, for example, there's been substantial uh, and widespread decreases in irrigated area. Um, but there are also other places, like if we zoom into uh, India and China, there are places where there's been really uh, large increases in irrigation right next to places where there's been decreases in irrigation. So there's really a lot of spatial heterogeneity. Um, and some of the places where there's been the, some of the largest increases in irrigation are in Northern India and in Northeast China, where there are known to be uh, water scarcity issues and issues of um, continuing freshwater depletion. So we wanted to look at how these changes in uh, irrigation patterns, to what extent they're occurring in places where uh, conditions of water scarcity already existed, or whether uh, irrigation expansion in particular is tending to take into account these uh, um, considerations of water scarcity and uh, expand in places where water resources are generally more available. So we define broadly water scarcity as existing when water consumption is greater than renewable availability in a location. And we split uh, water, water scarcity into three different categories. So no water scarcity, blue water scarcity, meaning that uh, there's greater water consumption than is available within uh, rivers, lakes, reservoirs, and aquifers. And then green water scarcity, meaning that there's not enough uh, precipitation that falls in a particular place to meet water demands, but there's sufficient blue water resources, uh, freshwater resources that can make up for that difference. So really the the portion of this that is of most concern is where there's uh, expansion or change happening in places where there's blue water scarcity. So uh, these columns are grouped uh, in sets of three for the world and for uh, several important irrigating countries. And the first column here shows the net change in irrigated areas. And then uh, the second column showing the gross expansion and the third column showing the gross decline. So if you add the second column to the third column, you get this first column here. 
Um, so there, on net, there's been a lot of irrigation expansion that's occurred, but that masks uh, out these um, these places where there's been large decline and where there's been large increases. And so if we look at the fraction of this expansion and decline that's uh, occurring in places where there's blue water scarcity, globally, we estimate that uh, a little more than 50% of gross irrigation expansion has occurred in places where conditions of water scarcity and water stress already existed. Um, but there have also been substantial declines in irrigated area in places where uh, blue water scarcity already existed. So to some extent, there's some offsetting that's been happening. Um, so moving on to uh, the work that we've done related to um, global crop climate sensitivity related, and this is related to uh, global irrigation expansion. We were interested in understanding where global crop production is most susceptible to climate related losses. So we wanted to attempt to quantify crop climate resilience and crop climate sensitivity in a spatially explicit and high resolution, high resolution and global way. So to do that, we uh, combined global maps of yield and harvested area for irrigated and rain fed crops for 18 major crops. And then we used a daily process based crop water model and historical climate data to estimate pixel level crop specific actual evapotranspiration across a 60 year period. And then for each of those annual actual evapotranspiration estimates, we sorted them from smallest to largest and then used uh, well-established empirical relationships between actual evapotranspiration and yield to estimate what the yield would be at 50th percentile actual evapotranspiration and 10th percentile actual evapotranspiration, assuming that uh, the yield at this 10th percentile is kind of representative of what the yield would be um, under historically observed extreme climate conditions. So we compared the 50th percentile yield essentially to the 10th percentile yield uh, and took the relative difference. And that's what we used as our measure of crop climate sensitivity. And so when we apply that methodology to every pixel where we know that uh, each of the crops that we're interested in is grown, we're able to develop these really interesting uh, global maps of crop climate sensitivity. So this is showing the example of rain fed maize and the areas that are darker red are the places where there's greater sensitivity to uh, climate variability and climate extremes. So you can see there are um, some hot spots in the US Midwest. There's some hot spots in central India and Pakistan, uh, as well as in Indonesia here. And so we did that for uh, each of the 18 major crops that we were interested in, and we did it for rain fed crops and irrigated crops separately. And so then we were thinking, uh, if you want to reduce this climate sensitivity, especially in hotspot areas, what are some solutions that you can potentially implement? So one of the solutions we looked at was, to what extent can you sustainably expand irrigation in places to convert rain-fed crops into irrigated crops and um, likely reduce the climate sensitivity overall or the variability in yields in those places? So the areas shown in blue in this map are the places where there's opportunity for sustainable irrigation expansion. So places where you could use more irrigation water but not deplete freshwater resources. And then the places shown in fuchsia uh, are the places where you couldn't expand irrigation to reduce the climate sensitivity of rain fed crops. So if we zoom into a few of these areas, you can see in the US Midwest, for instance, um, there's not an opportunity from a, from a water sustainability perspective to expand irrigation and address rain-fed maize sensitivity. 
Uh, but a lot of Western Africa, from a physical water availability perspective, there's a lot of opportunity for expanded irrigation. But there's a really contrasting picture for India, obviously, where uh, there's widespread unsustainable water use already. So irrigation expansion is probably not a viable solution for many places in order to reduce climate sensitivity in India. So there are some places where you can sustainably expand irrigation and reduce climate sensitivity, uh, but there are also places where you can't do that. So it's necessary to test out other interventions and whether those would potentially be effective. Um, so this, so we did a paired, a pairwise comparison uh, of the cumulative uh, climate sensitivity of different cereals as an example case, uh, different cereals that are grown in the monsoon season. So we looked at rice, maize, sorghum, and pearl millet. And this, the x-axis, which is uh, covered up, is showing uh, climate sensitivity. So the more, the, the further to the left you are on the x-axis, the greater the climate sensitivity is. And the y-axis is showing cumulative uh, production. So what you'd ideally like to see for a crop is that this curve is shifted far to the right, where most of the production's occurring in places where there's low climate sensitivity. So if you look at this example of rice here, the dashed line showing rain-fed rice production and the solid line showing uh, irrigated rice production. And as you'd expect, the rice line, is, the rain-fed rice line is shifted to the left. Uh, rain-fed rice is going to be more sensitive to climate variability than uh, irrigated rice. But what this allowed us to do also is to do paired comparisons across these different uh, cereals. And what I want to point out in particular is that uh, when we compare rice to any of these other monsoon cereals that the rice production and climate sensitivity lines tend to be to the left of uh, these other grains. So uh, controlling for location, um, rice tends to be more climate sensitive than these other crops. So in the places where there, um, where there's not opportunity to sustainably expand irrigation, we wanted to see, okay, if you switch a more sen climate sensitive crop with a less climate sensitive crop, how much more benefit could you get in terms of pre preventing production losses and also potentially uh, increasing production? So we did that pixel by pixel, and this is just showing a, um, a country by country summary here on the right of the avoided uh, production losses from climate variability if you were to expand irrigation or switch crops and the additional production that could potentially be gained by expanding irrigation or switching crops. So we found that uh, sustainable irrigation expansion can play a more important role globally, but there are lots of places where if you implement crop switching, it can potentially have large benefits as well. Um, and we found that a little more than 60% of rain-fed production losses associated, associated with climate variability could be avoided through these two example interventions. So that's just a couple of examples of ways that uh, these global analyses can be really uh, great sandboxes or testing grounds for looking at potential solutions and identifying where solutions might be most effective. But they only global analyses only go so far, and it's really important to take into account local considerations when you're actually attempting to fine tune solutions or implement them. Uh, so now I'll talk about some of the finer scale analyses that we've done um, related to crop switching, and then uh, some of the work that we're doing related to agricultural data scarcity. So for this first, for the first example related to crop switching, I'm going to be talking about the example of India, and this is just to give you a broad sense of how 
cereal production in India has been changing over the past several decades. Uh, this, the time series is a little bit outdated. It goes to 2009, but basically these trends have continued where uh, you can see that rice and wheat shown in orange and gray have continued to uh, dominate cereal supply in the country. And you can see that at the beginning of the time period, there was uh, a large portion of cereal supply that um, that was made up by some of these alternative or coarse cereals, maize, pearl millet, finger millet, and sorghum. But that by the end of the time period, yeah, rice and wheat have really come to dominate. And in large part, that's a result of Green Revolution efforts in the country to uh, prevent widespread hunger. And from this graph, it's really clear that India did do a good job of increasing overall grain production and increasing the availability of calories. Um, but that singular focus on uh, increasing calorie supply potentially led to trade-offs across other dimensions of sustainability related to food systems. So yeah, I'm going to be focusing on uh, opportunities for crop switching amongst monsoon cereals. So excluding wheat um, for, for the rest of this portion. So one of the reasons that rice and wheat were promoted uh, was because they were high yielding, high performing crops. Uh, and rice tends to have higher yields compared to these other cereals that are produced in India, with the exception of maize. Um, the maize and rice yield distributions are nearly identical, but you can see that yields for finger millet, pearl millet, and sorghum tend to be lower than yields for rice. But it's also well known that uh, rice tends to have lower nutrient content for key nutrients compared to some of these other cereals. So uh, one example of that is the iron content of milled rice. Uh, if you compare that to the iron content of these other cereals, it's um, quite smaller. And similarly for folate, there's um, rice, rice has much lower nutrient content in that regard. And so there's lower nutrient content and rice also tends to contribute disproportionately to greenhouse gas emissions and to resource use. So we've quantified different environmental footprints for the production of these different cereals in India. And um, probably not surprisingly, rice has a really high greenhouse gas footprint because of the methane emissions associated with its production primarily. Uh, and then rice tends to have a really high blue water footprint or uh, demand for irrigation compared to these other uh, monsoon cereals. So there's this tension between rice being higher yielding, but also having lower nutrient content and maybe uh, larger environmental impacts per unit of production. So with that in mind, we, we asked to what extent can optimized cropping patterns contribute to sustainability benefits in Indian cereal production? So we worked with collaborators at the Indian School of Business and first held a series of round tables with uh, intergovernmental agencies in the country, with ag ministries uh, at the state and federal level, uh, as well as research institutes focused on agriculture and nutrition in the country to try and understand what the sustainability priorities are um, for grain production and food production in general in India. And so we were able to come up with uh, a suite of priority areas that, um, that stakeholders would like grain production in India to achieve. So uh, that includes increased protein and iron supply, reduced water demand, greenhouse gas emissions and energy use, and enhanced uh, resilience to climate variability. 
So we set up a series of optimization scenarios where we tried to optimize for each of those objectives. And we, um, what we essentially did was reallocate harvested area within each district in India to different crops to try and uh, achieve those objectives. And we set uh, a few constraints that harvested area within each district, total harvested area within each district needs to remain constant, uh, that only crops currently grown uh, in a district could serve as a replacement for rice or could have harvested area either increased or decreased for them, and total calorie production for each state and at the national level needed to remain uh, constant or it couldn't decrease. So this is showing uh, the fraction of calories contributed by each of these cereals under the current situation, the bar on the left here, and then under each of our optimization objectives. So if we maximize protein, maximize iron, minimize water, minimize energy, minimize greenhouse gas emissions, or maximize resilience, what you can see is that consistently, regardless of the optimization objective, is that there's an increase in the contribution of coarse cereals to overall calorie supply. And then we're also able to quantify the uh, outcomes of these optimizations across these different dimensions that were identified as being of interest and priority. Uh, so what I'm showing here is the outcome in each panel. So this is total protein supply, total iron, et cetera. Um, and then each of the wedges corresponds to a specific optimization objective. So this red wedge, for example, is the scenario in which we try to maximize national iron supply. So if you look at the iron panel here, that wedge is the largest compared to the other wedges. Um, and the dashed line in each of these panels corresponds to the current situation. So if we follow this red wedge through, for example, we see that even though we're maximizing, trying to maximize iron supply, we saw that it increased protein uh, supply relative to current levels. It decreased irrigation demand, decreased energy, usage, decreased greenhouse gas emissions, and it enhanced uh, climate resilience where the dashed line is here at the origin. Um, so what we found is that regardless of the um, specific objective that we're trying to optimize for, that we were able to realize co-benefits across these different dimensions consistently. And because we did this in a spatially explicit manner, we're also able to um, point to those places that could disproportionately contribute benefits if, say, you wanted to uh, prioritize crop switching efforts in a particular place. So um, this is a regional breakdown. I'm sorry that some of this is covered up. Um, but basically, the uh, we found that the South region and the Central region in particular tend to uh, contribute a large portion of the benefits across different dimensions. So if uh, decision makers wanted to prioritize particular places or particular states or particular regions where they'd like to um, focus crop switching efforts in order to achieve some of these uh, co-benefits, those would be maybe the first places to attempt to do so. And so um, there's already some building momentum in India to include some of these coarse cereals in some of the public uh, food security programs. So uh, Odisha and Karnataka are both including some of these sorghums and millets in their uh, public food, food security programs. And um, through our interactions with local collaborators, uh, the information that we're generating here can be used to help inform uh, some of those efforts. So the last piece that I'll talk about uh, is related to addressing agricultural data scarcity. So that example that I showed for India was possible because agricultural statistics for India are really quite good and they're kept up to date and uh, it allows for those types of assessments directly. But there are lots of places where agricultural statistics aren't uh, regularly updated um, and that can prevent 
an understanding of even the current state of food systems, food system sustainability and food production in those places. So uh, some of the work that we're doing related to agricultural data scarcity is focused on Nigeria, where I've been doing research since 2010. Um, I have, so I have a close familiarity with the country. And uh, one of the reasons that we're focusing on Nigeria, in addition to kind of my personal connection, is that uh, it's the most populous African country. It's a major food producer for the continent. It's home to millions of uh, smallholder farmers, and it's endowed with abundant uh, natural resources that uh, equip it with large potential for increased crop and food production. But uh, agricultural information isn't regularly collected in the country. So the last ag census occurred in 2005, uh, and the data that does exist either isn't digitized, it's not systematically collated, or it's just simply not available. So a lot of the databases can either be out of date or incomplete. And um, oftentimes the ag information that's available can be anecdotal. So some of the state level production estimates uh, can rely on expert opinion alone to estimate how much production is happening for staple crops in those states. So, what this means is that the current state of information on agriculture in Nigeria is not yet uh, able to meet stakeholder information needs. So there's this critical need to know what's grown, where it's grown, and how much is grown. Pretty basic information needs that we're interested in trying to address. So we're working with uh, the Nigerian National Space uh, Research and Development Agency, so Nigeria's equivalent of NASA, uh, the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture, NASA Harvest, and uh, Clark University to work towards developing regularly updated field scale information on staple crop production across the entire country. And so the first step in doing that is we're developing uh, an automated field delineation workflow where we're using planet data and other satellite imagery. Um, and we're developing training data sets where we digitize individual field boundaries. And then we use a deep learning classification to uh, classify pixels as either being uh, inside a field, outside of a field, or a field boundary. And then we perform a final step of segmentation and vectorization to move from rasters to polygons to uh, delineate individual fields. Um, and so this is an example here on the right where we've got the raw satellite image uh, on the left and then kind of the final preliminary output of our field delineations on the right. Uh, and so what this can do is not only estimate total cropped area across the country, but also allow us to track how field sizes are changing through time uh, to see whether there are certain places or certain fields that are dropping out of production uh, or new fields that are being added into production. So it can allow us to get a really fine uh, spatiotemporal understanding of how cropland's changing in the country. So then uh, complementing that, we wanna know within each of those fields, what's being grown. Um, so we're working with uh, a team led by Dr. Catherine Nakalambe at, um, at NASA Harvest to use their uh, machine learning data pipeline to identify crop, crop type. Um, so the code that they've developed is freely available. It's called Street to Sat. It's available on GitHub. So if you want to, if you scan that QR code, you can uh, see their code repository. Uh, but basically the workflow is we use GoPro cameras either mounted on helmets or on, ve on uh, vehicles. And the GoPro cameras collect uh, two images every second as you're driving through an ag landscape. And they also collect uh, GPS coordinates. So within this machine, machine learning data pipeline that they've developed within each of the GoPro images that's captured, uh, 
they're able to identify uh, each of the individual plants within a specific GoPro image. Um, and so this is just one example. I'm not sure if you can read it, but these are boxes around every individual maize plant in this image. And so then for that image, you can assign either a single crop or several crops that are being grown in that particular field. And then because you know the GPS coordinate of the location where the photo was taken, uh, we're able to offset the location into the actual field itself. So then knowing the crop that's grown in the image and the location of the field that that image corresponds to, we can then generate a crop type uh, data label. And then those crop type data labels can be used, can be combined with uh, random forest classifiers or convolutional neural networks to uh, then develop comprehensive crop type maps. So this is just some preliminary work that we did uh, back in September in Southwestern Nigeria. These are some raw GoPro images from the data that we collected. You can see some really nice examples of, uh, this is a cassava field with some weeds underneath, a really nice, nicely maintained uh, soybean field here, a pretty weedy maize field and uh, a really nice example of uh, a yam field, so you can see the vines and the, the yam mounds here. Um, and this is just a picture of the, the research teams. We also collected some drone imagery to get spectral signatures for these different crops. Um, and we took this photo with some really big cassava plants behind us. Um, So yeah, these this work on crop switching, this work on addressing agricultural data scarcity, uh, it's all meant to help inform uh, context-specific analyses and assessments, and ultimately to fill information needs and data gaps that can uh, enable more accurate and more effective uh, global sustainability efforts. So just to summarize, uh, for the specific research examples that I showed, uh, some of the takeaways are that irrigated areas have changed substantially and uh, much of the expansion that's happened in global irrigation has happened in places where conditions of water stress already existed. Uh, so this type of information can be really useful in um, helping us to understand how patterns are changing, but also where policies are have been effective or where uh, policies potentially need to be revisited in order to be more effective. Um, these the global hotspots of uh, we've also shown that global hotspots of crop climate sensitivity are widespread, and the maps that we've developed can be really useful for identifying where. Uh, climate smart ag interventions may be most needed and they can potentially be used for testing uh, interventions like I showed with irrigation expansion or crop switching. Uh, and then with the work in India, uh, it shows that through targeted and thoughtful crop switching, you can potentially realize a suite of co-benefits. Uh, and this is a solution that can be that can be combined with other interventions uh, and tailored to local context as well. So the final thing I'll say is that I think all of these research examples point more broadly towards this, towards directions that we can head in food system sustainability research for making food systems more sustainable. Um, and the first is to define sustainability based on a diversity of perspectives uh, and from a variety of stakeholder groups. And what that enables is protecting against solutions that are not inclusive or that are potentially detri detrimental to some uh, groups within the stakeholder pool. Uh, the second is that once you've defined sustainability based on those stakeholder priorities, there's a need to quantify those dimensions of sustainability. And by quantifying them, you can actually measure what the current state of food system sustainability is, and you can also uh, objectively assess progress towards improving that sustainability. And by measuring those multiple dimensions, you can then assess co-benefits and trade-offs uh, of a particular solution. And that can enable 
ideally identifying solutions that promote win-wins and avoid uh, unintended impacts. And uh, so all of these, I think, lead into more effective solution creation across multiple scales and the development of solutions that can be uh, more effective and more accurate. So the, um, the one last thing I'll mention related to all of this is uh, if you're interested in reading more, we have a focus issue in environmental research letters that we've just finished off. One of your colleagues here at uh, Cornell, Prabhu Pingali, was one of the guest editors with us. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting research in, in this focus issue that covers a lot of the topics that I've talked about here today. And uh, we also put together a really nice editorial that you may find interesting as well. So uh, feel free to scan away. And so thank you all for your kind attention. That's it. Thank you so much. So we have time for a few questions. And um, if you speak loudly, I don't have to spend time walking around with this microphone. So if you have a question, you try to project. And if we really can't hear you, I will bring the mic to you. Thank you for the excellent presentation. So, I want to ask that for the education that are still uh, are sustainable. What are the consensus of this? Okay, can you repeat the first part? I couldn't hear you quite well. Okay. Uh, yeah, so assessing the state of uh, sustainable opportunities for sustainable irrigation in different places. It's largely, for this analysis that I showed you, it's purely based on the amount of water consumption that's currently happening in a place compared to uh, the, availability, the availability of water in that particular place. Um, so that's purely kind of a biophysical perspective of opportunities for sustainable irrigation expansion, but there's a variety of uh, economic, political, social constraints that need to also be taken into account to enable irrigation infrastructure, access to irrigation, access to energy for irrigation pumping to actually occur. So those types of things require a local focus and uh, that's that's really kind of future work for for this type of assessment that's that's a limitation of of the work that that we've done so far looking at opportunities for sustainable uh irrigation expansion but they're really important considerations and if you wanted to focus on uh specific locations or specific geographies those are things that are necessary uh and essential to take into consideration Yeah, I think uh, really depends on the specific location. So uh, yeah, I mean, one one consideration is is the necessary data available to be able to assess opportunities for irrigation expansion. Uh, two is uh, kind of universally true to gain uh, an in-depth understanding of what stakeholder priorities are and uh, whether and how irrigation expansion should take place. Um, and the third is to kind of complementary to that is to take account of the policy landscape, the economic landscape, the uh, those types of things that can limit opportunity, limit or enhance opportunities for irrigation expansion. 
We have a question from our online audience, which um, is in a similar vein. I think it's a, it has to do with the, you know, the feasibility of implementation. How can we translate all these findings to smallholder farmers? Continues. How can we bring them on board to make sure the proposed switches? And also, what does it mean to a consumer? How do we make those corresponding changes for consumers? Okay. Process. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So related to the question about uh, how these findings are potentially translatable to smallholder farmers, I think uh, it requires engaging with local research institutes, NGOs, um, and ensuring that smallholder farmers have a seat at the table when sustainability is getting defined, when priorities are being laid out for the types of interventions that are potentially needed. Um, the global scale analyses that I presented are really interesting thought experiments, but they're not useful for uh, deciding that a particular that a particular intervention is beneficial to a smallholder in a particular location. They're useful for broadly pointing to areas where interventions might potentially be effective. But uh, if you uh, if you want to help implement a solution that could potentially be beneficial beneficial to uh, smallholder farmers. You need to involve local extension agencies, local uh, research institutions, and the smallholder farmers themselves to understand that that's something that they actually want to change, and that they perceive that that they will find beneficial to themselves. Um, and what was the second question? Bringing consumers on board. Okay. How do we do that? Uh, yeah. So a lot of this, all the work that I presented here is production focused, and consumers are many steps removed from what's going on uh, at the production stage. And in many places, consumers uh, fortunately or unfortunately exercise limited influence on, over production choices. Um, so from a sustainability perspective, I think uh, it's good to be aware of the environmental impacts that your dietary choices are having, but the extent to which uh, your choice over uh, a particular dietary item might benefit a smallholder or a farmer in a particular location, uh, it's just not realistic to expect that a dietary choice is going to benefit, at, benefit producers at that scale. Time for one more. We'll go right here. We need to over many subsidized production. So that becomes a stress in the great market, right? So oftentimes it is over production, stress of water. So the subsidies, the way to sustain that's subsidies are one way to certainly influence production patterns and consumption patterns. The example I gave for India is perfect example where uh, the government has provided minimum guaranteed prices for rice and wheat production to smallholder farmers. And uh, that policy has been one of the big drivers of increasing production but it's produced environmentally perverse outcomes. Uh, so if uh, a greater suite of outcomes is potentially taken, to, taken into account when you're developing these subsidies, you can uh, theoretically shift production patterns towards more sustainable choices. But that comes with one identifying what that particular country or stakeholder group uh, perceives sustainability to be, and also generating the necessarily necessary political will to actually enact those subsidy changes as well. Thanks. Okay, well, thank you very much, Tyler.